Okay, I think we're ready. Um, today, we're going to go in and work on our bed. Well, not work on the bed itself. We're going to work on our firmware, actually. Actually, I guess the firmware resides over in here, down under, in there. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, we are going to take into account uh, the fact that our bed might be warped. It might have a bump in the middle of it or a hole in the middle of it or, or it might have waves all across it or one side that's higher than the other and we can't uh, fix it by turning the knobs on the bottom and leveling the bed, like making it, you know, level or whatever. Uh, I don't like using the word level because it's not necessarily that it's level. It's that it is square with all the motion of the hot end and everything else. Um, so this is called um, manual mesh bed leveling. So manual mesh bed leveling. Um, you don't need any additional hardware. You know, it's not a probe we're going to add. Actually, next week we'll do that. Next week we'll make an automatic process that can, can do this for us. Um, this will be a manual process. Um, we do have to enable it. Most printers don't come with this already enabled. Um, there might be some that do. Um, the Ender 3 does not. Uh, so we last, let's see, was it, well, whenever it was, a few lessons ago, we went in and changed out the firmware on our Ender 3 to the uh, TH3D unified firmware. Um, we picked that one because it's easy to work with. Um, it's basically a uh, version of Marlin that has been um, unified. So it has almost every printer you can think of at this, this price range um, and others, uh, higher level price ranges too. This is pretty much at the bottom of the price range currently. Um, has all the printers built into it already and it's really easy to adapt it to the printer that you have. Um, so this X that you see, or now that you see uh, on here is a test print. And so if our bed was really warped or whatever, then it would be really difficult to print all the way across the entire bed like this and get a nice print. It either come unglued at some part, you know, it'd peel up, um, or maybe you would have some ridges in one part where it was too close or maybe it wouldn't even extrude because it was too close um, but uh, let's, let's zoom in you know it, it's pretty pretty solid all the way across there I don't see I mean there's one little piece right here where it kind of didn't stick um, I don't remember if that's a what well, it printed it yesterday so I don't really remember uh, but generally across the whole bed uh, it is pretty uniform. This side might be a little bit, the corner might be a little bit low compared to over here still. Um, but let's go through the process for how we would do this. Let's fill this thing off. First, let's talk about what it even is. Um, so see, we've got a little bit of stringing there. How this one didn't quite get stuck in, but these did. Um, this, oh, so this was this way. This row probably could have been a little bit closer to the bed. Um, I'm actually going to go through the whole process again in a second uh, to install it again. Uh, but I don't know, I think it's generally a pretty good level, although there might be a little bit of stuff that we can get even better. Um, so, what this does is, and this bed, I don't know, it, it's relatively flat, but uh, let's zoom back out of it. What it does is I'm going to simulate, we've got a big hump in the middle of our bed. You know, it's not flat now. There's a big bowl in the middle. Um, maybe you have a cup in the middle of yours or whatever. Maybe it's just full of waves. What happens when you uh, do any kind of um, mesh bed leveling is before you go in and uh, print, um, usually with the manual one, it's not before every print. It's once and then you keep that data stored for many, many prints. Um, but the printer will go in and figure out the height of different parts of the bed. Um, so the one that we're gonna do, it's gonna do a row of five probes and then five row of those rows. So there'll be 25 points that the uh, bed height will be measured. Um, when you're doing this automatically, a lot of times it's maybe only three, one, two, three, and then three in rows of that, so nine points total, just because it takes a while to do it, um, the more points you have. Obviously, the more points you have, the finer the uh, information, the, more, the finer the resolution that you have available for mapping this bed. So anyway, you go ahead and map the bed before the print starts. Um, and then 
as the print is occurring on the first few layers, if this was a big bow in the middle of our bed, then um, the Z motor back, back there will actually be active and raising the print head up to trace across the surface here instead of just trying to drive across it and just print on top of this bow or down in that cup then the the print head will be raised and lowered as necessary to maintain the optimal print distance uh, as it's printing across that irregularity in your surface so that's what it does um, let's get this off of here how to install it um, we'll need to upload some firmware um, and it's there's a super with this <clears throat> with this particular piece of firmware that we're using the um, TH3D firmware I put a link in the description there in case you didn't remember where it was at um, it, it can be done in other firmware like I said Marlin can do this just as simply in fact TH3D is built on top of Marlin so let's plug it in all right, remember when you plug in uh, the USB, you will get power to the electronics. You won't have power to the stepper motors or anything like that, um, but you'll have power to the electronics. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's go and get our, close out some windows here. Uh, you'll need to see this screen. Let's see this, this will work. So all I've done here is open up the um, the TH3D Unified Firmware Revision 2 folder. And inside there, we've got one that's open firmware windows.bat. So they give you a little batch file that'll get you straight into editing the firmware. Otherwise, you open Arduino and, and open the firmware. But usually this works. They have their own version, or well, their customized version of Arduino. Um, built into this package already that's one of the packages kind of large it's like 550 megabytes or so oh it opened on the wrong window here we go um so it opened up over here let's get it to where you can actually see the whole screen though and so remember what's going on here is i have um i don't even know how many a hundred tabs of different folders well, you can't see that. That's off the side. Um, but I'm scrolling through. If, if there's a little uh, drop-down button here, and it pops up off the side of the screen, you can kind of see the edge of it there. Um, but all of these are individual little sketches that are part of the firmware. The way this firmware is set up, and the way Marlin in general is set up, is that you don't normally go in and edit all of those little files. That would that would be a lot to try and work your way through. Most of your editing. It's going to occur in this one, configuration.h. Sometimes you'll go over to the advanced.h. And I think every now and then we might go to one of these others um, to do some very specific things. But all we need to go is configuration.h and search. I'm sorry, I did control F to search for manual because we want to do manual mesh bed leveling. Um, let's see. Here it is right there. So the second one, manual mesh leveling. So remember these little symbols are comments uh, so that this line is actually just text. It's not code of any kind. Um, when you get your firmware, this line is also commented out. So something like that. Actually, I don't remember if there's a space there. I think it's like that. And this little block of code is talking about the, activating the manual mesh leveling. And it gives you some uh, details. Here's the setup instructions on the marlinfirmware.org website. Um, it does give you this little disclaimer if used with a 1284p board so remember when we opened up the uh, printer inside there the little chip the atmel chip that was basically the processor uh, for our printer was a 1284p it had that number and letter written on it so if used with that board which we have the boot screen will be disabled so we won't have a boot screen anymore when we start up our printer that's not a big deal it's just a logo and the firmware version <clears throat> so it's going to disable that in order to save space so there's a limited amount of space on the board inside the printer and um, we're going to add some new code to it because we want this manual mesh leveling active um, so that will take up some space and they're just going to turn off the boot screen to make room for it basically um, 
they do give you uh, the, the fact that if you do have a Wenhao i3 Plus, uh, apparently it, this won't work on it because of the LCD screen. So the, the LCD screen over here, for I don't have one of those printers, so I don't know exactly what the issue is, but there's some issue with the LCD. Maybe it doesn't have enough lines on it or something. Um, if you want to automate the leveling process, then that's the this company has a kit that uh, will have a probe. We're not going to use that particular probe. Um, we're going to use the BL Touch next week. Um, but here's all you do: is we delete those two markers, those two forward slashes, and now this is active code. And somewhere else in all of this, um, you know, all of this code, somewhere else, there is a if manual mesh bed leveling is active statement basically uh, do all these things so we just made those things possible um, by uncommenting those two lines then I've already uploaded it to mine so I don't want to necessarily upload it again um, but you would go in to upload well first you would go to tools make sure you're on the Sanguino 1284p if you're on the Ender 3 um, make sure you're on the right COM port mine turned into COM 8 this time um, and then you would click the little upload. So it'll compile the code first, figure out exactly what code needs to be sent to the printer. Not all of this gets sent to the printer. The printer doesn't get any of the commented out things or any things that are dependent on commented out, uh, like this, servo pin 27. It wouldn't get that piece of code somewhere else that's dependent on that because it's not defined. Um, so, we would uh, now have, after you upload it, we would have a new option on our printer. So now let's go to our printer um, and let's walk through some of what you would do once it's on the printer, once it's active. Let's see, let's get, let's get some, let's get that. All right, here's a grid pattern of what basically we're gonna have to do this is manual now, so it's not going to automatically go do it. It automates it a little bit. So it does the moving around. The printer moves to each of these points, but we have to manually tell it the distance between uh, that it needs to raise or lower. And we'll, we'll do that through the LCD screen. Um, if you don't do it through the LCD screen, uh, then it is much more um, time consuming to, in my mind because you have to send G code through the uh, computer, the PC, to the printer, and it's just a time-consuming thing. Um, the LCD bed leveling, which is the one that we just enabled, um, is it, it takes us several minutes to do, but it's not problematic to do. One thing we need to do, I'm gonna go ahead and unplug, let's see, let's get this, get all this stuff out of the way. There we go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unplug it. We'll turn it on to regular power now, um, and not USB power. Uh, there's no boot screen. I don't know if you could get caught that or not, but there was no boot screen when it loaded up. That's all that it erased. So it was just that little logo and the firmware version that, uh, and actually the firmware version is written on here now. Uh, it might've been before also. It's on there now though. So you can keep up with what version you're on. We're on uh, release two B3. So if we ever forget which one we're on, then we could look there and see versus looking at the boot screen. Um, so for bed leveling in general, whether you're doing the mesh bed leveling or you're just trying to level the four corners, you should have the bed certainly heated and you should heat the nozzle also. Um, the nozzle is not gonna change shape quite as much as the bed, but the bed will pretty significantly change shape um, as it's heated. So whatever material you plan to print with, um, you should preheat to that materials preset. So I'm going to print with mostly on this printer with PLA. Um, I think on Monday we do have printing with flexibles though. So um, we'll try some flexible material in here. Um, so I'm going to go to prepare and preheat PLA. And then I'm going to heat, heat the bed and the hot end um, just so that they're already up to temperature and they're not uh, they're, they're stable at that point more or less um, we also need I usually cut the end off of a sheet of paper so that we can kind of run it under the uh, nozzle between the nozzle and the bed um, I like these 
thinner strips versus like a whole sheet of paper because it's hard to maneuver a whole sheet. Um, so we're going to need, that's just the end off of a regular sheet of copy paper, nothing special there. Um, all right, so it's going to take a minute to heat up. Let's go back to here. Um, so every one of these points um, is going to be probed. So the, the print head is going to move to every one of those points across the bed. Um, and we will adjust the knob here to raise and lower the nozzle, or the whole print head actually, um, until there is a, a decent amount of friction between, you can kind of see here, maybe you can see, I don't know, probably not, it's kind of washed out, um, friction between the piece of paper that we're going to be using and the uh, nozzle and bed. So it's going to um, drag between them both. Um, and so this map gets created of all these different heights. Uh, and so obviously the more points that you probe, the more accurate your map is going to be of the bed. Um, with 5x5, five five, you have 25 points. For a bed this size, that's, that's plenty. Um, and then interpolations will be done between all of these points to figure out um, what the bed looks like in 3D. You know, it's not really just flat. It does have some raised spots and lowered spots compared to the average spot. Um, while you're doing this, if you want to write down the uh, height, that you had to adjust the nozzle, you had to raise it up 0.5 millimeters, or you had to lower it down 0.25 mil, or whatever it is. Um, then, if you want to write those down, you can plug them into Excel. Um, there are some online uh, bed mapping routines. You can plug those points in, and uh, it will plot a picture of an, an exaggerated picture of what your bed looks like. If you want to visualize what your bed looks like, I don't know if we'll do that or not. Um, maybe we'll try it. Um, I haven't ever actually done that before, but we can do that um, so that you could see if the bed has a high spot or a low spot or waves or whatever. Um, if one side is high, it might just be that you could adjust the whole bed with the leveling knobs. Um, you should do that before printing. You should have it as level as you can uh, before you go in and print. Um, <clears throat> one thing about this this bed leveling is that it's only usually active for the first few layers of your print so the entire print doesn't necessarily have to adjust for the bed leveling it, it kind of fades out as you get three or four layers into your print um, i did not set and i didn't look to set uh, the number of layers so i don't know what uh, this particular firmware uh, coded in as the number of layers to use with the bed leveling routine um, while you're printing um, it's usually like three or four. Um, let's see where we're at on our temperature. I, we are up to temperature. All right, so here's what you do. Let's see if we can get closer here. Zoom in a little bit. Um, first, we need to look over here. Um, let's just do an auto home. Make sure there's no junk on the bed, like I had a uh, little strip, purge strip still on there. Make sure the nozzle is clean, which mine isn't. I need to get something to it off. Um, because if you have stuff stuck on the nozzle and you're trying to measure the height that the nozzle is above the uh, bed, then this could, well, where'd you go? There it is. This could create problems. It's all blurry, but it's just a ooze, a little bit of ooze. So I want to get that off of there the best I can. You might even retract the filament a little bit. That would be in prepare move axis extruder and then we'll um i don't know a couple of millimeters up all right that's one millimeter all right so that maybe it'll quit oozing let me do a little bit more all right so i just pulled six millimeters of filament back up into the thing so it won't ooze on us um it looks clear now. All right, so uh, this bed should be relatively level already, but if it's not, then go in and just manually go to the four corners and adjust the knobs to get it as level as you can. Um, then in here, we've got prepare. Uh, we've got, if we scroll down, there's bed leveling. This is a new option. 
that we didn't have before. Let's see if we can. There we go, bed leveling. Um, and then we've got uh, level bed. This is the routine we want to run. We could change the whole Z if we want to. So it's going to go and do its own homing routine. So let's look at that. All right, so now it's telling me over here, click to begin. I've got my paper ready. All right, so it's on point one of 25. You didn't see that, but uh, that's where it was. All right, so I can't even slide the paper between here. So I need to raise this. So clockwise we'll raise it. Let's see. There we go. Oh, I said I was going to write these down. Let me get a sheet of paper. So this corner, I had to raise it 0.175 to get it uh, to where it would slide under there with some friction. I might actually lower it a little bit. I actually am going to do 0.125 actually. So I overshot. Then I'll click and it'll move to the next one. This one feels even looser, so I'm going to lower it down. Actually, quite a bit. All right, there. Negative point one. So that corner was higher than that, according to this, anyway. Um, now we're we need to lower it down even more. I like that. Negative zero point one seven five. Oh, that one's really tight. I need to raise it. Negative point oh two five. And then the last corner, pretty tight, needs to raise some more. Wow. Corners on mine are pretty high. All right, I'm going to say that I really need to raise it 0.225. So it's kind of high on the corners and dipped down in the middle right now. All right. Have to lower this one. And so you go across, I have to finish the whole bed now. If you, I guess if you canceled the routine, turned it off or something, um, none of the data would be stored. And uh, I don't know if, I don't think it would overwrite existing data that you already had in there. Um, I don't think it does that until after you finish the routine. You might every now and then hear the stepper motors um, kind of making a interesting sound. We're using very tiny steps, so it's doing some micro stepping that uh, might create some sounds every now and then. Here again, this this side is just very high compared to the rest of the printer, so. It looks like, you know, I remember I put a bowl on top of here. It actually looks like it's cupped downwards. Um, if you're not printing very large prints, then this is not as necessary. It's only when you're trying to use kind of the whole bed.
to print that this is something you need to do. See, I've got to lower it a good bit down here to, to get this the right height. Mm, call it that. This is halfway done. Having to lower it again. One of the reasons I like the long strip of paper is because, um, oh, that's really close. It kind of buckles if you try to push it under and it's too close. And so it gives you just one more piece of information. The bed is hot. I just touched it. So uh, <laughs> be aware that it is kind of toasty. last row anyway. Oh, that one's the same. See how it buckles when it's too close? there. And so you can kind of see why you wouldn't want to do this before every print. It's kind of one of those things you do once every now and then. Um, as long as you don't go in and like do something that you think would mess up the bed then you can kind of leave it in place the uh the one that we'll do next week before every print it goes in and probes it doesn't probe five times unless you tell it to um it's going to probe just nine times Let's see where we're at this is the last row This is the same procedure you would use if you were just leveling the four corners in the middle. Um, same idea here. I still use a sheet of strip of paper like this and just go to the four corners and get the bed as level as you can um, to try and print. Um, but if, you're, if it's warped pretty badly and you're trying to print across the whole thing, it, it might have trouble. One thing you can do if your bed is really warped um, and you're having trouble printing across the whole length of it is to print with a raft and so what that does is it takes a lot more time and filament for a large part like that but um, the raft will more or less work itself out um, and le be level on top of the raft once you start printing it just takes a lot more filament and time to, in particular trying to print a raft over the whole thing Having trouble getting this one set. I guess it's just right in the gap between two of these. Be sure that you're not like pressing down on the bed, which would be kind of obvious if you were because it is really pretty hot. But you don't want to, you know, bend the bed up or compress any of the springs while you're doing this. Let's see. I'll call that uh, a little bit tight. It's all good there. Okay. 
So you heard that little ding sound. That means leveling's done. It's going to go back over here. Rehome. Um, that sound meant that it stored the settings, but I'm just going to go in and make sure that I click on store settings again. So I scroll down and I'm going to store settings again so it actually stores that data in the um, printer. Um, here's our map. So you can see a bunch of negative numbers over in here so and positive numbers around the outside. So we've kind of got a hole right here. Um, I think we could probably, let's see if I can find an online mapping tool. Let's see. Oh. Let's specify this for 3D printers, otherwise you get all kinds of maps. Uh, visualizer, that's what we want. Let's see. Uh, actually, there. So here we can put our data in here. So I'm just going to type in, I didn't even notice, let's see if it was, yeah, it's just, oh, okay, let's actually put our data in here. Can I edit it directly, I think? Yeah, and we don't need any of that. It's not really, actually, this is gonna make it difficult to do. Let's, let's use Excel to set it up and then put it in there. This is just for entertainment purposes. I just kinda of wanna see what it looks like. Um, so we've just got Excel over here. It looked like that particular one had, um, well, let's, let's go back and, it had zeros for the uh, column header and row headers to start at zero. Actually, I guess it would start at zero over here. And we did uh, one, two, three, we did five points, so zero through four, and then we did five rows. And then this, I'll put this one as the back left corner. Notice they're all in like increments of five thousandths or whatever. Uh, that's just the minimum step size that my printer was set up for. If we typed them all in right, we should be able to copy, let's get rid of all of these, paste, and there it is. So according to this, there's a big hole in the middle of our bit. Now this is exaggerated, right? Um, I don't know the scale that it exaggerates it at. Maybe it says somewhere, uh, I don't know. But um, that's the, the shape of our bed that we're working with here. So, and it does look like, you know, this is 0.5 millimeters, this first level up here, and there's zero right there. So it is not nearly as bad as the, it makes it look here, but you can kind of see that in general, there's a big low spot in the middle of the bed and the corners are kind of high. And this is typical, you know, or the opposite of this where there's a bow in the middle of the bed, but usually um, it's pretty typical that there's a low spot in the middle of the bed. Um, I don't want to print with a raft all the time, so I'm going to use this data that we just, you know, all of this data to go in and um, help the printer trace along this hole in the middle of the bed. Other things you can do, um, you can apply a glass bed, so glass is generally flat, um, and you can just put that on top of your uh, print bed. What that does though, um, let's see, let's get all this stuff out of the way. 
you know, this one we did add the, it's probably locked. No, it's not. Um, we did add the uh, steel, spring steel bed, um, but on top of your printing surface, you know, we wouldn't have necessarily added this other thing, the magnetic part on top of a glass bed, but um, you could put the glass bed on top. Generally, glass is pretty flat, uh, and um, even a mirror can have the advantage that the back side of it is coated, you know, to make it reflective. So a lot of times that's a silver material that's on the back of those mirrors. So it kind of helps spread out the heat. You know, silver's conductive as far as heat goes. So it kind of helps distribute the heat across the whole bed more evenly. Um, and generally mirrors and glass are flat um, and not as likely to buckle. The downside to adding um, a piece of glass on top of a printer like this is that they're pretty heavy generally and the bed moving back and forth um, is one of the big sources for you know uh, ringing or ghosting in your print so where it's kind of vibrating because it had to move one direction and then quickly change directions and move the other direction so it limits your printing speed or it's going to make the print surface kind of wobbly anytime that bed had to shift back and forth um, the other thing is that bed, uh, that glass is an insulator, so the heat from your heated bed uh, has a tougher time getting all the way through the the glass and everything else to to affect your print. Um, so, it, but there are a lot of printers that typically print on a glass surface. Um, and the cool thing about it is, let's see, uh, it might be cool, it might not be. You end up with. A glassy finish. I don't know if you can kind of, you can kind of see how it reflects there. You end up with a really glassy finish on the surface that was on the glass. Um, so if you want that, it is nice. <clears throat> All right, so we've got our data in here. How do we use it? All right, now we need to go to Cura. Let's close out all these things. Let's go back over here. Um, have we done this? All right, so no, we haven't. We've only done this step. Um, so we went and probed the 25 different points. We even plotted them just to see what it looked like. You can kind of tell just by looking at the numbers that there was negative numbers in the middle, positive numbers on the perimeter, so it was a hole in the middle. Um, now we need to go into, um, well, actually, we've done all this. This is loading it into the uh, firmware in the first place. <clears throat> um, we, did we do all of this? Yes, the, we talked about the boot screen was gone. We preheated everything. Um, I didn't do this step where we go in and do the four corners bed leveling as normal. It had already been done for this printer, so didn't really need to do that again. Um, oh, I will mention, though, that um, if you do that now, if I go and un you know, change any of these corners, that's probably not going to work well with the data from the mesh that's in here. So if I do anything that changes the shape of this bed, raises one corner or changes it somehow maybe I, maybe I scrape on it really hard trying to get a part off then that data is probably not valid anymore um, that's one good thing about having the magnetic beds is that you can just pick the magnetic thing off and then remove the part versus trying to have to scrape the part off as it's on the printer now another thing with the PEI remember this is a PEI coated bed is that once it cools down same thing with glass once they cool down most materials will just come off of them don't print PETG on glass or PEI without some kind of glue stick or some kind of release reagent because they will not peel off even when it's cool or hot or whatever. Um, but uh, they have to be physically removed. But PLA, uh, it will just lift off of these. Um, so we did this. We cleaned the nozzle. We did write these down and looked at the thing. We did click save. Um, so now we need to go to Cura, and we need to go in and change our startup code. So let's find Cura. So here's here's Cura. I've got a, another screen in front of Cura, though. There we go. Um, so remember, I've got two printers installed on this particular version of Cura. I've got uh, the Ender 3 that we're working with now and the TiVo Tornado, which is another printer. But we want the Ender 3. All right, so we click on there. We're going to manage our printers. Make sure we're on the Ender 3 machine settings. And in here, you've got things like you can change, define how big the printer is. And all of those should have been set by default when you 
uh, installed the particular printer that you're using uh, for the first time when you went through Add Printer. Um, unless your printer wasn't in Cura's list and you had to m manually put these things in there. All of these should be fine, but over here, you've got little bits of code, the start G code and the end G code. So these are little bits of code that will automatically be added to the start or the end <clears throat> of any STL that you slice. So when you slice the STL, it creates a whole string of G code. Tomorrow, no, Friday, um, we will look at uh, what all this G code means. For day, today, we're gonna look at like what one line means, maybe two lines. Um, but by default, this line is not in there. So everything else we have here is the standard Cura start and end G code um, for an Ender 3. So like it came from Cura this way. Um, in fact, it says Ender 3, custom start G code. Um, so all of these are given specific commands to the machine. Usually it's to home, make sure that it knows where home is, heat up the bed, heat up the extruder, all that kind of stuff. Um, this line right here is not in there though. So this M420S, what this does is it, uh, and I, I wrote, you have to go and type this in. So it's not like an insert or anything. It doesn't automatically happen. You have to go type it in. You just, you just click here and you know you can edit. So you type in M40S, um, and this part is just a comment that reminds you what M40S does. And basically it enables all that data that we put uh, for the mesh that's on the printer. It, it has that data stored on it, we, as long as you click stored settings. Uh, I actually think it automatically stores it, but I just do it in case that it doesn't. Um, so it's on here. And then um, to use it, you actually have to insert some G code into the um, file that you're about to print. And this is the G code you insert, M420S. Um, the G28 command here, that is home, it even says home all axis. So that's where it goes and it clicks around the different corners of the bed to figure out where 000 is. Um, the M420S needs to be after that because uh, homing, the G28 command, sometimes yours will say G28X, X0, Y0, then that, that's just homing X and Y and then there'll be a separate Z. After any G28 command, um, the, the mesh data is kind of, put it to the side and not use. So you have to say after any of the G28 commands that are in your start code, that's where you put M420 to tell it to use the mesh data that's stored on the machine. Um, and that's it. Um, you don't have to go and com um, create a new mesh every time. With the automatic stuff, typically you do create a new mesh every time, but it's only nine points. And so it's relatively quick, still takes a minute or two, and it's automated. You don't, you're automated. You don't have to go in and turn the knob or anything like that. Um, so you do that, close this to save it in there, close that. Um, I'm going to print, let's see if I can find the file that I'm going to print. Uh, I'm going to print this file right here. It is, do I still have it open? Here it is. It's just a big X is all it is. Um, so it's one layer thick and it's just a big X. And so it kind of covers the whole print. It takes about 20 minutes to, to print this whole thing out. I don't know if we'll sit here and watch it print for 20 minutes, but um, that's what it does. And um, it kind of gives you a, an idea that uh, the mesh leveling is working because it does cover more or less the whole print bed. Unless you had like a specific thing in one little corner where it doesn't have some. Another version of this is it just prints uh, five little squares, one in the middle and one at each corner. Um, that one might take a little bit less time to print, but um, I don't know, this one works fine for me. So it's the one that I linked in here. Um, so that's the file number for it. It's also in the description if you want to print that one. It doesn't really matter which one you print. It's just something that kind of covers the whole bed. Doesn't take an extremely long amount of time to print. Um, so as this thing's printing, we should be able to feel the Z-axis coupler on the, the Z-stepper motor. Um, I'll show you on the printer and when we get back to it. Um, it'll slightly move. It won't move a lot unless your bed's really out of shape. But um, you should be able to feel it moving as the print is happening. So it's raising and lowering the print head to try and map to that deformed surface of your bed. 
Um, you don't have to do this every time unless you have done something to the bed that you think has invalidated that data set. Um, so the magnetic removable bed, so it, whether it's the binder clips or whatever, if you can remove the bed surface, the print surface, um, each time, then that will probably help maintain that uh, validity of that data set longer. Um, because if you go and pry parts from the bed, then there's a good chance you've, uh, you might even, if you're really rough with it, you might even bend the bed. That, that'd be a lot of work to do, but um, more than likely you just knocked it out of level. Um, you do have to put that 420 command in there. Without that, it's not going to use the data. Um, and it has to be after the G28 commands. However many you have in your startup code, it has to be after all of them. Um, all right, so let's see if how this works. So let's get to Cura. Let's put that part in here. Let's see. Did I download it? I might have to re-download it. See if it's there. It is. It's just a big X. You can scale it up and down if you want to. Um, I think I'll just leave it like this. We will slice it. At, if you do it at 0.2 millimeters, it just comes out as one layer. Versus um, if you do a thinner number like 0.1, then you get two layers of it. Uh, I'm just going to do one layer. 21 minutes. We're going to put that on our SD card. Okay. Um, oh, one thing I did, didn't did tell you, while you're printing, or not while you're printing, while you are um, creating the mesh in the first place, turning the knob and it's going to all the different 25 points, if the Z um, axis limiter, so the little switch that clicks every time you move the Z axis down to the very bottom, if it clicks while you're doing that, um, you have to start all the way over. So. Um, you do kind of want your z-axis height to be set correctly before you start this um, Because if you trigger that little switch while it's doing then you got to start over because and you got to move the z-axis switch down And then do it again. Otherwise um, If that switch gets triggered while you're printing then your prints gonna stop So you don't want it to trigger while you and I don't think I heard it trigger while we were printing I'm pretty sure I didn't hear it um, oh, oh, yeah, we got to save this Lost my train of thought. Save to removable. Um, we will eject that. It's called CE3, so the Creality Ender 3 is the way Cura names a lot of their files by default is it tells you what printer it's for, um, and then the name, Test Cross. So, let's see if we can get all of our, back to our printer. All right, I want to see kind of back at the side over here now. All right. Actually, let's get further around. All right, so back here is the coupler for the Z stepper and the Z axis lead screw. Um, so as this is printing, that should be moving. Um, I got to get the file loaded up first. Let's see. Test cross. There it is. All right, um, we're already at temperature, so it shouldn't take too long to get started. <clears throat> Sorry, there it goes. It's going through. That's the G28 command to home everything. There's the purge line. Which, oh, yeah, remember we extracted some of the filament, so we might actually have a uh, gap in our print because uh, we had moved the filament up to keep it from oozing. So it, it did start. All right, so now this little part... I can, f you can't see it at all by any means, but I can touch this lightly and I can feel it moving back and forth um, ever so slightly. Um, trying to adjust for the changing shape of the bed. Whenever it starts going across this middle, that's where our lowest spot is kind of in the middle. You would be able to feel a lot more change. But if this little guy is kind of kind of barely clicking around while this is happening then you have successfully enabled that mesh data um, so it's just doing a couple of purge lines right now they look okay um, I would generally say that this corner over here is still a little too close 
compared to some of these others this one's a little bit far away and this one's a little bit close you if you're brave enough you could go in and just tweak this one a little bit to make it um, to pull this corner down a little you can kind of feel you don't want a bunch of grease on your print bed but you can kind of feel the the raised print um, and if uh, back here it's much more raised than it is over here you can see that too just by the amount of squish uh, these lines are thicker than the lines at the back um, showing that they're more squished out um, so you could do tiny little tweaks to, to try and level it out a little bit but if you not move the knobs too much then that mesh data is going to not necessarily be valid any longer it's still going to use it um, but it may not be quite as valid as you want it to be because you you measured it all with the bed in one position um, or if you measure it all with the bed at 60 degrees and then you print it at 40 degrees it might also be a little bit different so um, you, you really want the bed and nozzle to be at printing temperature for whatever material you're using um, so now I should be it's going across the middle and I can feel a good bit more movement it's still not enough that you can see it from there um, but you can feel the little bit of movement that's going on um, but it does look like it will stick down I'll probably let it finish. I'm not going to sit there and watch it the whole time. It takes 20 minutes or so. It's not a terribly long print. Um, some of the ones that you could have this a little narrower if you wanted and make it a little faster. Um, but this is a, a generally good test to see if most of your bed is going to be printable. Um, because that's what you want. You want the you want to be able to use the entire bed surface if, if you have it. So um, if you're printing little tiny pieces that just kind of exist in one part of the bed, then this isn't going to give you much value because um, in general a bed that uh, you're only looking for a, you know a couple of square inches is probably flat enough in that little area so just print in that flat spot wherever it is on your bed um, and print your little pieces right there and it should be fine but if you want to print something larger or print 10 different things and cover more of the bed surface you're probably going to have to look into some kind of uh, mapping uh, whether it's the manual one or the one we'll do next week that's automatic. On beds this size, the, the automatic one where you remap every time, it's probably overkill, but I'm going to show you how to set it up just so it's there um, and uh, you can see how it works. Um, this does look good though. I still think this is a little bit low on that corner. I'm going to pull it down just a little bit to see. Um, I meant uh, that the nozzle is too close to the bed uh so i'm going to pull that corner down the corner was too high all right um i think that's good for today next time on friday we're going to look more into g code like how can we write our own g code what do all the different commands mean how can we edit those to do special things um, some of it we can do in cura so we can get into cura and edit g code there we just did some of that we can edit more of that if we want to we can change this end and start code entirely if we want to. Um, so there's, we'll look at what these different commands mean and, and how to read them and how to write your own. Uh, maybe not entirely from scratch, but um, maybe a little bit from scratch. All right, see you on Friday.